Om Namah Shivaya students. In the previous video, we have seen that Mrs. Pearson has become very dominating and very clear to her words and her needs. And she has made it very clear to her own daughter and son. She has made them understand. She has made them understand that she is not their servant and will always not be available to serve them. She has her own life and her own needs that she will make everyone clear. Now let's see what happens next. Cyril must grab something to eat. Looks as if I'll need to keep my strength up. Cyril exits to the kitchen. Doris, moving to the seat anxiously, Mummy, you don't mean you're not going to do anything on Saturday and Sunday? Mrs. Pearson, airily, no, I wouldn't go that far. I might make a bet or two and do a bit of cooking as a favor. Which means, of course, I'll have to be asked very nicely and thanked for everything and generally made a fuss of. But any of you 40 are a weakers who expect to be waited on hand and foot on Saturday and Sunday with no thanks for it are in for a nasty disappointment. Might go off for the weekend perhaps. So... Cyril exits to find something to eat in the kitchen as he finally have understand, understood that his mother is not going to feed him or provide him anything to eat. He feels it necessary as he would require the strength to face all of this. Doris, still amazed at what Mrs. Pearson said before confirms if she was joking about it or not most importantly about working on Saturday and Sunday because she also understood that she need to work on the weekends as well. Mrs. Pearson explains that she might do a few petty tasks if she is pleasantly asked to do so and is duly thanked for performing them as well. She warns her that if any of her family members who work for only 8 hours a day and keep blabbering about it expect her to perform all their tasks, then they are going to be let down this time. She even mentions that she could go for a vacation as well on the weekends. Doris, aghast, go for the weekend? Mrs. Pearson, why not? I could do with a change. Stuck here day after day, week after week. If I don't need a change, who does? Doris. But where would you go? Who would you go with? Mrs. Pearson. That's my business. You don't ask me where you should go and who you should go with. Do you? Doris. That's different. More shocked to know that Mrs. Pearson said that she might go on a vacation this weekend as well. Mrs. Pearson replies that she, out of all, deserves to take a break as she works day and night continuously. Doris is confused as to where she would go and with whom. Mrs. Pearson expresses that Doris has no business asking her all this because she never asks Doris the same stuff. To which Doris tells that that she does it not the same because Doris feels herself to be an independent personality which her mother is not as her mother is bound to be at home. Mrs. Pearson The only difference is that I am a lot older and better able to look after myself. So it's you who should do the asking. Doris, did you fall or hit yourself with something? Mrs. Pearson, coldly, no. But I'll hit you with something, girl, if you don't stop asking silly questions. Doris stares at her open mouth, ready to cry. Doris, oh, this is awful. She begins to cry, not passionately. Mrs. Pearson, coldly, stop blubbering. You're not a baby. If you are old enough to go out with Charlie Spence, you are old enough to behave properly. Now stop it. So, you see how weirdly her mother is behaving 
to Doris, which is so very much unknown to her and which is making her even cry. See, uh, Mrs. Pearson clarifies that she is older than Doris and is a, as in a better position to take care of herself. So obviously it would make sense if Doris would take permission from Mrs. Pearson and not the other way around. It means being a daughter, she is not even bothered to tell her mother or even seek permission for going out. And she is questioning her mother where she want to go. This is very not of her age kind of a thing. Doris finally asks Mrs. Pearson if she hit herself and got concussion or something. Bluntly, Mrs. Pearson replies that she is completely fine but if Doris doesn't stop talking, then she might hit her with something for sure. Almost about to cry, Doris expresses how disheartening it is to go through all this and while she says it, she bursts into tears. Mrs. Pearson asks Doris to stop acting like a child. She bluntly says that if she considers herself mature enough to go out with Charlie Spence, then obviously she should act properly at home as well. George Pearson enters left. He is about 50, fundamentally decent but solemn. Self-important, pompous preferably. He should be a heavy, slow-moving type. He notices Doris's tears. So, here we see a new character, George Pearson. A description of the character is also given. His age is about 50 years. He is a decent looking man and he is very pompous means he is quite proud enough and self-important. It is there in his gestures and he is a bit heavy so he moves slowly. With the age, we get it very clear that it is Mrs. Pearson's husband and he sees her do his daughter in tears. So, see, George, hello, what's this? Can't be anything to cry about, Doris, through sobs, you'll see. So, as they were talking, George Pearson, Mrs. Pearson's husband enters. As he enters, he notices that Doris is crying okay then he asks her what's the matter and is sure the matter won't be worthy of crying doris tells her father to wait and observe while she is crying and runs out of the scene doris runs out left with a sob or two on the way george stares after uh, after her a moment then looks at mrs pearson so now we'll see a conversation between the husband and the wife. George, did she say you'll see? Mrs. Pearson, yes. George, what did she mean? Mrs. Pearson, but I ask her. George looks slowly again at the door and then at Mrs. Pearson. Then he notices the stout that Mrs. Pearson raises for another sip. His eyes almost bulge. So, George Pearson is left amazed at how she ran and what she said. Mrs. Pearson replies to George's rhetorical question with a positivity. He is still confused about what is going on. Mrs. Pearson advises him to ask Doris what, is, what did she mean. So, we see here that George is astonished, he is surprised with the behavior of his daughter and he was a bit struck also with the replies, with the stern replies and crisp replies his wife was giving to him and when he looked at her, he found her having a sip of the stout which was very, very, very unusual of her and he was shocked and his eyes almost bulged out. Then George... Stout, Mrs. Pearson, yes. George amazed. What are you drink, drinking stout for, Mrs. Pearson? Because I fancy it some. George, at this time of the day? Mrs. Pearson, yes. What's wrong with it at this time of the day? George bewildered. Nothing, I suppose Annie. But I have never seen you do it before, Mrs. Pearson. Well, you're seeing me now. 
As Mrs. Pearson raised her glass to sip her stout, George gets even more shocked. Mrs. Pearson lets him know that he saw the right thing. Still amazed, he asked the reason behind her drinking at that very time of the day. And again still maintaining her calm, she simply replies by saying that she is drinking it because she wanted to. He is shocked at the sight of Mrs. Pearson drinking and that too during the day. She counter questions and asks what is the problem with drinking at this time, at that time of the day. He explains that he is shocked because Mrs. Pearson had never seen, been seen day drinking. She tells him that there is nothing to be shocked about. If he hadn't seen her do it till date, he is seeing her do it now. George, with heavy distaste. Yes, and I don't like it. It doesn't look right. I'm surprised at you, Mrs. Pearson. Well, that ought to be a nice change of you, George. What do you mean? Mrs. Pearson, it must be some time since you were surprised at me, George. George, I don't like surprises. I'm all for a steady going on. You ought to know that by this time. By the way, I forgot to tell you this morning I wouldn't want any tea. Special snooker match night at the club tonight. And a bit of supper going, so no tea. Mrs. Pearson, that's all right. There isn't any. So, in contempt, he tells Mrs. Pearson that he didn't like the idea of her drinking at this hour. It blew his mind at once. Responding to his act reaction, she says that it could be a nice change for him to see it now. He did not understand what she was trying to say. She explains that it hasn't been a long, it's been a long time since she amazed him. He tells her how he doesn't appreciate change or surprises and this is something Mrs. Pearson should know by then. He then changes the topic by telling Mrs. Pearson that he forgot to tell her about the special snooker match and the supper. Also, he won't be needing any tea that afternoon. She tells him that there isn't any tea made, so it's fine enough if he forgot to convey. So you see how dominating this husband is to his wife that... He will be dictating her when and how and what she should be doing. Whether she should be drinking or not. Which time of the day she should be drinking. Whether she should be giving any surprises or not. And she has to react and act according to his likings and dislikings. Which he never does. He never even felt like telling her that he won't be having supper at home. And has fixed up all his plans without letting her know. And all, if all these three people go out in the evening and have their food outside, it means that this lady, after the day's hard work, will have to sit alone on the dinner table and have a food by herself only. So they don't have a concern of having a family dinner or supper together. So there, in this chapter, throughout till here, we see there is no family bonding. It is the individuals who are very much concerned about themselves only and it is the mother who is concerned about all of them and not even concerned about herself and no one is also concerned about her. Let's move on. George, astonished. You mean you didn't get any ready, ready? Mrs. Pearson? Yes. And a good thing too, as it turned out, George agreed. That's all very well, but suppose I, I would want it some. I'd want it some. Mrs. Pearson, my goodness. Listen to the man. Annoyed because I don't get a tea for him that he doesn't even want. Ever tried that at the club? George, tried what at the club? Shocked at her reply? Because for the first time she has denied of something. She had made her choices. She had put her sentences in forth. He asks Mrs. Pearson what she just told him. Mrs. Pearson replies and says that it has turned out to be well because he didn't need any. He asks Mrs. Pearson what if he wanted some tea. Mrs. Pearson expresses her bafflement at the fact that George Pearson is angry that the tea he didn't want is not made. 
She suggests that he should try this behavior at the club sometime. He is not sure as to what Mrs. Pearson is telling him to try at the club. Mrs. Pearson going up to the bar and telling him you don't want a glass of beer but you are annoyed because they haven't already poured it out. Try that on them and see what you get. George, I don't know what you are talking about. Mrs. Pearson, they'd laugh at you even more than they do now. George, indignantly, laugh at me? They don't laugh at me. She explains the tea situation in context of the club where he goes to the bar to tell them that he doesn't want a beer and then he gets mad at them because they hadn't already put, put some for him. She suggests that he should try that in the club and see their reaction. He pretends to not have understood what Mrs. Pearson just said. Because this is not possible for him to do now outside. This can only be done with his wife. With his rather, I would say, submissive wife. Mrs. Pearson says that the people at the club would make fun of him even more than they did. He gets irritated when Mrs. Pearson says that. And tells her that they don't make fun of him. Mrs. Pearson. Of course they do. You ought to have found that out by this time. Anybody else would have done. You are one of their standing jokes. Famous. They call you Pompey Ompey Pearson because they think you are so slow and pompous. George. Horrified. Never. Mrs. Pearson. It's always beaten me why you should should want to spend so much time at a place where they are always laughing at you behind your back and calling you names leaving your wife at home night after night instead of going out with her who doesn't make you look a fool mrs pearson tells him that he should have known this by now if they there would have been someone else in this place they would have known this by now she also tells him that he is famously made fun about at the club and they call him Pompey Ompey Pearson because they think he is self-absorbed and overbearing. George is horrified at her words and denies it. And in this dialogue of Mrs. Pearson, we see her making her own heart come out and express all her needs and desires and what her heart wants. She is a wife and she is left alone. She can't even get a time to speak to her husband, to share to her husband. This is the basic thing what a wife wants, to share her, out, her heart out with her husband, to have a moment of their own, but she doesn't get it at all because her husband is very busy at the club where he is made fun out of. Mrs. Pearson expresses how hurtful it has been for her seeing her husband leaving her and wanting to go to a place where people make fun of him behind his back. She further adds that he does it every night instead of going out with Mrs. Pearson who doesn't at least make him look like a fool. So till here we see that she is very straightforward with her husband as well and finally puts her heart out. This may be from Mrs. Fitzgerald, but Mrs. Fitzgerald reads Mrs. Pearson very well. She is a very good friend and neighbor of hers. She sees the situation. She knows the condition of Mrs. Pearson and she is very well aware what her heart wants. And through her body, she makes it come out in front of everyone. So in the next video, we'll see what happens next. We'll move on with the play in the, from the next video as well. Thank you. Om Namah Shivaya.